Our theme for this entire, for this entire series has been Romans 12.2, where it says, and let's read this together, all right? Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Man, what a powerful verse that is. Powerful concept. He's telling us we do not have to live the way we do in this world. So in these messages we've been talking about, we've been talking about several dimensions of your life and we're seeking transformation in them, okay? We talked about spiritual health and we talked about physical health and mental health and emotional health and relational health. We've talked about all those things. Do you remember this at all? Yes. Thank you, that's the right answer. Today we're gonna to talk about financial health. Jesus said more about money than he did about heaven or hell. He actually did. One half of all of Jesus' parables that are brought down to us in the New Testament are about our material possessions. Wow. One half of them. One out of six verses that are in the first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are about what? Money. Have you been here the last five minutes? Okay, just checking. All right. Mm -hmm. Now, why is this? Why would Jesus talk so much about money? Well, the reason is, is because money has a tremendous power and influence in our lives. Did you hear that? Yeah, oh yeah, you know it. And the fact is that if you don't manage your money, your money is going to end up managing you. And it's not fun. So, in order to illustrate this, I want to read probably the most misunderstood story Jesus ever told. It's found in Luke, the 16th chapter, verses 1 through 13. It is a mystifying, it is a mystifying parable that he talks about here. People have misunderstood it, for, well, right up until today, okay? So we're going to do this. I'm going to read this to you. You follow along. Don't have to read with me. I've got this one on my own, okay? All right. It's the story of the shrewd manager that Jesus told in Luke the 16th chapter. Jesus said this, he said, there once was a rich man who enlisted a manager to take care of his property. But the manager was accused of wasting his master's possessions. So the owner called him in and said, you must now give me an account of your stewardship and report what you've done with what I entrusted to you because your time as a manager is ending. We understand what this is, don't we? He's being audited. That's what it means. He's being audited. So the manager, this is the shrewd manager that we're talking about, the manager thought to himself, what am I going to do now? I'm losing my job. But I'm not strong enough to dig ditches. And I'm too proud to beg. I love that part. I know what I'll do. So that after I lose my job, I'll have plenty of friends to take care of me. He's thinking. So he called in everybody who was in debt to his master. And he asked the first man, how much do you owe my master? And the man replied, 800 gallons of olive oil. And the manager said, Okay, he said, here's what we're gonna do. Tear up that bill for 800 gallons of olive oil and write a new bill that says you only owe 400 gallons. Are you still with me? <laughs> Lost here in the olive oil thing? Okay. All right, okay. Next, the manager found another debtor and asked, how much do you owe? And that debtor said, I owe him a thousand bushels of wheat. And the manager said, okay, he said, change your bill to say you only owe 800 bushels of wheat. 
And he's making this agreement. You understand, this is all under the table. You got the picture here? It's all under the table without permission of the owner. Now, when the master, the owner, you see, heard what the dishonest manager had done, because it's always found out, folks. It is always found out. When he heard what the dishonest manager had done, he still praised his shrewdness. For worldly people are more shrewd in handling their affairs than are those who belong to the light, he said. Hmm. Now, it appears that Jesus is approving the dishonesty of this crooked manager. He's not. But what he is doing in this parable is he's using the example of a crook, which is this dishonest manager, he's using him as an example of something. Now, as I said, this may be the most shocking and frustrating parable that Jesus ever told. But it's important to note as we look at this parable, do you remember the parable? I just told it to you. Do you remember the parable? All right, I'm just check it. In the first place, Jesus does not praise his dishonesty. He praised his shrewdness. That's what he praised. The fact is that you can still learn, and we, we need to learn, see, from people, even though we don't respect their honesty and wouldn't do business with them, we need to pay attention to how people who get things done get them done. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, it's kind of like this. I remember about 20 years ago when I had to go in for surgery. And so I'm sitting with the surgeon, and he's, he's telling me what's going to happen. And finally he says to me, do you have any questions? And I said, oh yeah. Now interestingly enough, I did not ask him if he was a Nazarene, see? I didn't even have to ask him if he was a Christian. My question for him was, have you ever done this before? <laughs> he said, thousands of times. I said, then I have no more questions. I needed him to tell me he knew what he was doing. And he is saying about this dishonest clerk here, he is saying he is shrewd. He knew what he was doing. Now let's take a look at who his audience was, who Jesus' audience was when he told this parable. This is a parable that he is telling for the benefit of the Pharisees. Do you remember the Pharisees? Thank you both. The rest of you, here's what they are. Pharisees are a sect of Judaism. They are the most religious people in the country. They are highly hypocritical. And they've got the best idea for every person they meet. They know exactly what you should do and shouldn't do. And Jesus, Jesus just didn't care much for the Pharisees. They were the religious leaders, all right, but they were self-righteous. They were judgmental. They were hypocritical. And Jesus just loved to poke at them, to shock them. So, it says in Luke, the 16th chapter, beginning with the 14th verse, it describes for us some things about the Pharisees, which explains to us why Jesus was choosing them. It says, the Pharisees dearly loved money. So when they heard what Jesus said, they made fun of him. But Jesus told them, you're always making yourselves look good. But God sees what is in your heart. The things that most people think are important Jesus said to the Pharisees. The things that most people think are important are worthless as far as God is concerned. He's just describing for them exactly what God's economy is like, what it's for. Now the fact is that most people today, not just the sinners, we believers, we who are in the light as he described us, the problem is that we see and use money exactly the opposite of what God intends in our lives. Yes, we do. Mm -hmm. So we have this second point. This parable is also to us. And the reason is, is because many believers, you know who that is? 
many believers, that would be us. I know you lost track there for a minute. <laughs> many believers are poor money managers in their own life. They are, see? Luke 16, 8, it says this. Read this with me. All together, here we go. For worldly people are more shrewd in handling their affairs than are those who belong to the light. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Now, when I start accusing people of being poor money managers, you got to understand that I am not standing in any sign of protection. I mean, I have been a poor money manager for most of my life. I know what this is about. I know what it means. You know, I didn't have any savings at all. I never kept any savings at all until I turned 65 years of age. That's the first time I ever saved any money. You know what that is? Poor money management. That's what that is. See, I know what this is. So let's talk a minute about shrewdness. Shrewdness. What is shrewdness? Well, shrewdness is described as having a keen awareness that you are smart, that you are strategic, that you are resourceful. It means you're sharp. Shrewdness. And that is what Jesus is talking about here. It means that you... You be shrewd, you can see the problem clearly, whatever it may be, you see it. You know what needs to be done, and you figure out how to do it. That's shrewd, see. Nowhere in there is listed panic. No panic in there. You see what the problem is, you know what needs to be done, and you figure out how to do it. When we talk about money, God wants you to learn biblical shrewdness. It'll transform your life. It will. And from this story, I'm going to give you four things we are taught not to do with money. There are four things not to do with it. And there are five things to remember about money. So there's going to be nine points in all. Are you going to be able to keep up with it? Are you going to stay awake? All right. I got to tell you right now, it won't do you any good to go outside. It's raining. Okay? Might as well stay. Four things not to do with money. All right. The first thing we learn from this story is what not to do with money. Number one, don't waste it. That's what we learned from this story. Don't waste the money. It says in Luke, the 16th chapter and the second verse, Read it with me. The manager was accused of wasting his master's possessions. Wasting his money. Mm -hmm. Don't waste it. Now, I would love to spend the rest of the day right here and start listing the ways that we waste money. We could have testimonies. We could have each of you stand up and tell us how you've wasted money. But we're not going to do that. Okay. Number two. About money, don't do this. Don't love it and don't live for it. Don't love it and don't live for it. It says in Luke, the 16th chapter of the 13th verse. Read this with me. No servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Well, can't do it. It is impossible to live with a divided allegiance. The heart of the problem is the problem of our heart. You can't have that divided allegiance. God wants your heart. That's what he died to bring to you a salvation of your heart. Let me ask you this. Have you ever tried to work for two bosses at the same time? You ever tried to do that? How'd that work out for you? Mm -hmm. Nah, it didn't work out very well, did it? Nope, nope. I've always thought this is one of the greatest arguments for why you should only have one wife and one husband at a time. <laughs> See? If you can't work for two bosses, then don't get two wives. Yeah, well, Jesus lays it out for us in black and white. 
God wants your heart. It isn't vague. He doesn't say you shouldn't have two masters. He says you can't have two masters. You can't serve God and money. Nothing choice about it. Not just that you shouldn't. You can't. It won't work. It's impossible. Hmm. Here's what you need to do. It means that I must choose what I love for most in life. Will I love people or will I love money? If I love people, then I have every right to use my money, okay? The problem always comes up is that when people love money, then they begin to use people. See, that's the problem with it. It's easy for money to become a god. Number three, don't do this. Don't trust it for security. Don't trust money for security. Now the manager, he learned that pretty quickly. He said there in this third verse of that 16th chapter, he said, what am I going to do now? I'm losing my job. Help, help, help. That's what he did. I threw in the help, help, help. <laughs> it says in Proverbs, the 23rd chapter, the fifth verse. Read that with me. It says, your money can be gone in a flash as if it had grown wings and flown away like an eagle. Do you know how you can remind yourself of this? Just look at a dollar bill. It has an eagle on it. You know why it has an eagle on it? It's to remind you that it can just fly away just like that. See? So it tells us that in the Bible. I didn't just make that up. Here's number four. Don't expect it to satisfy. Don't expect money to satisfy. It's from Ecclesiastes, the fifth chapter, the tenth verse. Read it with me. Whoever loves money will never have enough, and whoever loves wealth will never be satisfied with his income. You can't ever get enough. They asked, I think it was Getty, J. Paul Getty or Howard Hughes, one of, those, one of those dead billionaires. And they asked him one time, said, you know, how much, how much money do you need to have enough? And he said, just a little more. See? Just never could get enough of it. Never could. Yep. It says there in Luke, the 12th chapter, the 15th verse. Read this with me. Guard against all kinds of greed because your life is not measured by how much you own. Well, that doesn't sound much like California, does it? See? But the Bible says that's true. That when the person who measures our life, who comes to us and begins to audit our life, it's not going to be how much stuff you've got. See? It's going to be the condition of your heart. Now, all of this information runs directly against what our culture teaches us, what the environment, what our society teaches us, what advertise goes right against that. And so what I have here is I have here five, we call them countercultural truths about money. Here they are. If you remember and act on these, it'll transform your life. It truly will. You need to remember this. Every day you need to remember this. Number one. It all belongs to God. It all belongs to God. You don't really own anything. None of us do. God owns it all. It wasn't yours when you were born. It will not be yours after you die. See, it all belongs to God. We get to use it for a while. We get to make payments on it for a while. But it all belongs to God. And you know what that tells us? Since it's only loaned to us, we are all of us in management to manage that. That's what we are all doing. Okay? If you start looking at everything this way, you'll find that the worries of your life will drastically diminish. You will worry a lot less. In verse 1 of this story, the owner enlisted a manager to take care of his property. 
Now, how well, really, let me ask you, how well are you taking care of God's property? Because it's all his, everything that you have. The rest of the verse 1 says that this guy was wasting the manager's possessions. The fact is, any time I waste money, I am wasting God's money. And I've had enough experience to know this. See, I am wasting God's money. All right. Second truth to remember. Every day, here it is. Number two, God is using money to test me. This is a test. And he's using money to test me. You see, God does not just give spiritual power to anyone, you know. He tests our faithfulness. When he tests our faithfulness, then he is testing us continually. God's favorite tool to test you with is your finances. That's what he's using. You are hoping, you were hoping that that dusty Bible on the coffee table that used to belong to your grandma, you were hoping that was what he was looking for, weren't you? No, no, he's looking at your checkbook. That's what he's looking at. That's how he tests us, checks us out. Yep. So what are these things that are tested about? What, what is tested? Well, number one, when he looks at my money, it shows, you see, it gives indication about what I love most in my life. Not what I say I love. What do I really love most in my life? It says in Matthew, the sixth chapter, beginning with the 19th verse, Read this with me, will you? Don't store up treasure here on earth. Instead, store your treasures in heaven. For wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. Whatever matters most to you, that's what your heart is. That's the possession of it. God deserves and God insists on first place in my life, just as he insists upon it in your life as well. Whenever I live for money, you see, then it becomes the master. And when I give money, it becomes my servant. So whenever I take this test personally, he is telling me that it has to be showing what I love most. Hmm. Another thing it shows us in this test is it shows us, it shows what I trust I say every once in a while when we receive the offering here at the church, you know, we, don't, we don't take the offering because the church needs the money. We give in the offering in order to show what we love the most, what's the most important to us. To show that money does not have us in its clutches and we can actually part with it without expecting any return whatsoever. It says in Proverbs eleven twenty eight, read this with me. If you trust in your money, you will fall. But if you trust in God, you will flourish like a green tree. What kind of tree would you be? Uh, never mind. <laughs> but he says you'll flourish if you trust in God. Sometimes we go through periods when we feel like spiritually our lives are stuck on dead center. Sometimes we just can't find any joy in it. Sometimes we can't find any hope in it. We've got the spiritual blahs. We don't grow. We have no power in our life. That happens to us, doesn't it? Yeah, you know. Mm -hmm. Find ourselves kind of on a spiritual roller coaster, up, down, around. My first advice is you need to check your, your checkbook. You need to check what you're giving. It reveals your priorities. It may have been that your priorities have shifted, have slipped, to where rather than God's will, your priority is how much money have I got? One of the things that it tests in me is it shows if God can trust me. If God can trust me. When we have out of control finances in our life, it has a tendency to reveal an out of control life. It really does. And then there's for us here one of the most important truths in the entire Bible. It's in Luke the 16th chapter, starting with the 11th verse. You want to read it with me? Good, I'm glad to hear it. Here we go. All right. Whoever can be trusted with very little 
can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. If you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? It's pretty basic, isn't it? I mean, don't we get it? We understand it, sure. Jesus says clearly, he says, how much, how I handle money determines how much God can bless my life. That's what he's saying right here. There's a direct connection here, you see, between maturity, spiritual maturity, and money. There's a direct connection between spiritual power and the stuff we've got, our possessions. There's a direct connection, it says right here, between the blessings we receive and the bucks that we think about all the time. Yep. Number three. Money is a tool to be used for God's purposes. That's what it teaches us. Money is a tool to be used for God's purposes. It says in Luke, the 16th chapter, the ninth verse, strangely, we would probably kind of just skimmed over it the first time, but here's what it says. It says, I tell you, use your worldly wealth. Yeah. Use your worldly wealth. You're not supposed to just hoard it and stockpile it and worship it and love it. It's to be used. It's a part of your life. You are to use temporary resources that you've got. You've got to use them for good. What did Jesus like about this guy, anyway, this dishonest manager? He planned a dishonest scheme. He writes off one guy's debt at 50%, writes off another one by 20%, does it without the owner's approval. Why? Why did Jesus like this guy? Well, they will think kindly of me when I am unemployed. He had a plan. See, Jesus is using him as an example that we are supposed to have a plan in our life. He doesn't want you to have a crooked one, see, but he wants you to have some plan. The plan was wrong. It was dishonest. But when he made that plan, he did three things that were right. And here they are, okay? He looked ahead. He's supposed to do that. What am I going to do now? God expects us to look ahead, not just to sit blindly there and let it overwhelm us. It says in Proverbs 14, 8, the wise man looks ahead, the fool attempts to fool himself and won't face the facts. Well... What facts are you refusing to face? You know, what are they? Have you faced the fact yet that making a minimum, minimum payment on credit card debt means that it will not come due and be paid off until long after you're dead? Have you faced that fact yet? Yeah. The other thing that he did was he made a plan. See? Verse 4, I know what I'll do. This is what the crook said. I know what I'll do. So the question is, do you have a plan? How do you know if you're planning? How do you know this? I can tell you. If you have a plan, you have a budget for it. If you don't have a budget for it, you're dreaming. See, you're just dreaming. Mm -hmm. it says Proverbs 16, 9. We should make plans. Everybody, come on, come on. Everybody, we should make plans, counting on God to direct us. Yep, make plans. Those of you that are involved in small groups, you ought to make this a matter of discussion in your small group. Support each other, encourage each other. The next thing that he did, this guy, is he acted quickly. He did not procrastinate. He did not put it off. He didn't delay. He got his plan moving, got it in motion. He didn't say, Someday I'm going to get my finances in order so this doesn't matter. He didn't say that, see. He said, I got to do something today because I don't want to dig ditches and I'm not going to go stand out at the street corner with will work for food signs. He had a plan. Luke 16, 4, I know what I'll do, he said, so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their homes. Now, this is, the, this is the very thing that Jesus 
commends. He's commended, he's commended for this. <laughs> he says he's taking the long view. Jesus wants us to take the long view to our lives for the best use of money. The opposite of our culture that we live in, we know this. It is spend it now. Borrow it now and spend it now. Borrow it against future paychecks and spend it now. It's the kind of world we live in. And Jesus is giving us clear lessons here about how we are supposed to live. Hmm. And then this is another one of those countercultural truths, okay? Number four, the best use is to use it your money for getting people to heaven. That's the best possible use, to get people to heaven. So it says there in Luke 16, 9, read this with me. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, they will welcome you into your inter eternal dwelling. Well, it seems a little fishy to me, doesn't it? A little bit? Use your wealth so that you can get friends. But you've got to understand what Jesus is talking about. He is talking here about heaven. Friends in heaven. That's what he's talking about. He's not saying that you buy your way into heaven. You can't do that, Grace. It's free anyway, see? You can't purchase your eternal salvation. Can't do that because it's free. But what he's talking about here is using your money to build relationships that will last forever. Forever. So that when you go into heaven, there will be thousands of people there cheering because you, you followed up with them and you gave in order that they might know Jesus. Mm. So just like the manager used money today to make friends for the future, which is what he was doing, it is also us. What, when I use money to help people meet Jesus, I make friends for eternity and I gain rewards for eternity. It says, you will be welcomed into. Imagine them saying, all of them, thousands of them, gathered around the pearly gates, been waiting for you. You come in through the pearly gates and they are all singing out, shouting out, saying, we're here because of you. That's making friends, see. Because of you gave, because of what you did. When I get to heaven, there will be thousands of friends. I want to be there with you. I want heaven full of people who cheer when you come in the gate. I'm going to be one of them. You know, we're all going to cheer. Yay! You made it. We're so glad that you didn't spend all your money on big screen televisions. <laughs> so how do you store up treasures in heaven? Well, the way you store up treasures in heaven is by investing in people that are going there. That's how you do it. Just invest in them. And here's the fifth thing that you need to remember. Okay? One day, I will give an account to God. Every one of us, this is true. One day, I will give an account to God, and God will come, and there will be a life audit on me. It says in Luke, the 16th chapter, the second verse, this owner, he was saying to this guy, and he said, read it with me, you must now give me an account of your stewardship and report what you've done with what I entrusted to you because your time as a manager is ending. Well, let me tell you something. This is a fact. All of our management, as we have God's money that we're dealing with, is going to come to an end. We are not managers forever. We are only managers here on this earth. And so God has entrusted certain of his assets to you during your time here. I know there are some of you want to wish he would entrust you with a little more see, of the assets. But it may be that he knows better than you how much you can handle it. Mm -hmm. He's watching 
you to see how faithful you have been. You will not be here forever. One day, your management career on this earth is going to be over. Romans 14, 12, read this with me. Yes, each of us will have to give a personal account to God. I'm faith, if I'm faithful with little, God can trust me with more. It says in Luke 16, 10, read it with me. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little, oh yeah, well we, oh yeah, you know it's true. I can remember when I first entered the workforce when I was about 15 years old. And I really believed, you see, that I could work, I could work better, work harder if they paid me more. If they would pay me more, then I would work harder. You ever, you, did that thought ever cross your mind when you were entering? Huh? Yeah. If they had just paid me more, see, it wasn't up to me, of course, you know. I, I just was only working at, you know, like about 20% level. If they would double my wages, I could put out, you know, I could do wonders. Which, of course, they never did because I hadn't proven that I could do that. It's kind of like that. Mm -hmm. These principles apply in every area of our life. They apply to our talent. If we are willing to use what talent we have received, we will receive, receive the ability to gain more. Our influence, our responsibility, our money. Let's look at Matthew 25, 29. Here it is. Read it with me. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. Faithfulness in little ways produces fruitfulness in big ways in our lives. I know, there, you know, we've said, we've all been through this. You know, well, when I finally start making some money, then I'll start paying my tithe. See, which never happens, see. Once I get up there to that level, then I'll be able to put it in. No, 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 no. You begin now. Has to begin now, immediately. This is where it starts. If you're going to be obedient with what God has provided for you. Let me, uh, let's do this. I want you to bow your heads, if you would, please. I, I want us to do some honest self-evaluation right now. These questions. Does God really have first place in my life? Can God trust me with what he's had allowed me to have? Does the way I'm using my money show God that I can be trusted with more? What or how much am I investing for eternity? Who will be in heaven because of me? Why don't you say this prayer as I pray it? I'm just, I'll say the words, you just run them through your mind, address them to God. Just say something like this. Just say, dear God, I don't want to waste money. Just say it in your mind. God, I don't want to love it. I don't want to live for it. And I don't want to trust in it for my security. Those are all dead ends. I don't want to expect it to satisfy and meet the needs that only you can meet in my life. And so God, from this day forward, from this moment forward, help me to remember every day that it all belongs to you. That I don't really own anything and it's all just on loan from God and you're going to loan it to somebody else when I'm gone. God, I want what I do with my money to show that I love you the most. And I want what I do with my money to show that I trust you for security and not my bank account or income. And God, I want you to look at the way I'm using my life and my money and know that you can trust me with greater responsibility. I know that one day I'll have to give an account to you for how I used my life and what I did with what I was given. You said that where your treasure is, your heart is. So God, I want to give you my heart today, right now. Jesus, I don't understand it all, but as much as I know how, I ask you to come into my life. I want a relationship with you. Not a religion, dear Lord. 
I want to know you and love you and serve you and feel your love. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.